Glad that you guys are, are here this morning. Again, another plug. I'm going to sound like an echo, but come tonight. It is so good. It is so good. Uh, come back tonight, 6 o'clock. And then also next Sunday night, the empty chair service. This isn't just for people who have recently experienced loss. You may have lost a parent or a sibling or a child, and it's been 5, 10 decades Ago. This is a very meaningful uh, service, and this time of year is difficult, but this will bring honor in remembering them, and so I hope that you'll come uh, next Sunday night. Now, just out of curiosity, by a show of hands, how many were here last Sunday night for the kids' program? All right, good, good, good. We uh, love the kids' program. We didn't have it for a couple years there with all the craziness, but this is a picture of uh, my oldest son, uh, Sam. He's in the Santa Claus sequence. If you flip the little beads up or whatever, it turns into a T-Rex with a Santa Claus hat. He loves that. It's his buddy Judah um, next to it. Sam uh, just kind of tolerates the dancing and the singing part. He's not really his thing, but he did a really good job, and I was, I was proud of him, and I asked him, they sang uh, two songs, the elementary did. I said, which one did you like better? And he goes, well, I really like the slower song, which essentially sang the words of Isaiah 9 of the, the coming Messiah, a wonderful counselor, and he goes, I, I really like that because I, th- I, I just find it really neat and powerful when you're singing words from the Bible. And, and I kind of, he's, he's our theologian, like in the, for sure, in, in the house. Like he asks all the questions. And I kind of like was, was talking, I'm like, you know, what, what were you feeling? And I, I just, you know, kind of just brought it out of him. He was feeling the presence of God as he was just singing that song. And that's why he enjoyed that. Um, and so that's really neat. This is our youngest, Essie. Uh, she's three. She's the one that I always tell stories about. She's a wild card. She did awesome. Okay, she did 37 circles spinning her dress while singing, Um, was just absolutely loving it, jumped up and down, it was fantastic. And then we've got our middle child, Paisley, who's five. Let's just say uh, I don't see a um, Broadway future uh, for for her. (laughs) She started crying before she even got up the platform. She got right about here and just, just a big ugly tear, crocodile tears and everything. So mom brought a, a teddy bear, gave it to her, and people are trying to console her. No. Um, but we, we made her stick it out, and uh, we had some conversations. Said, you know, it's okay to try new things. You're in a safe environment. You're safe. Mommy and daddy were right there. You know, like sometimes you just have to stick through with a commitment that we make, and you've practiced. We're going to do this. And so uh, she might need counseling later, and uh, we know some people that can, can help out with that. Uh, but I, I figured some of you guys just enjoy seeing my kids. I love showing them off any, any chance I can. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. To those joining online, I want to say welcome. Glad that you are here. Um, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 103. We're going to be looking at both of those. We're continuing in our series, Gift Exchange. And uh, when God sent his son Jesus to the world, he did so knowing that there would be several exchanges that take place. Last week, Pastor August talked about how we can exchange our worry for God's peace. And this morning, I'm going to be talking to you about how we can exchange our hurt for his healing. And all of these exchanges are made possible through the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why we celebrate Christmas, because Christmas changed the course of history. If it weren't for Jesus coming, we would still be in our hurt. We would still be in our grief. We would still be in worry. But we can have these great exchanges. And the prophet Isaiah foretold this of Jesus' death. And so as we read this, this is a foretelling of Jesus' death In Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities or our sins. The punishment that brought us peace. What kind of peace? What brought what type of peace? Peace with God. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, or maybe your version says stripes, we are healed. 
We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity or the sins of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Are you guys getting a picture of the crucifixion as we read this? You're starting, it's kind of coming back to you, right? Verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Do you remember whose tomb he was laid in? A wealthy man named Joseph. And with the rich in his death, Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Did Jesus rise from the dead? You'll see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities or their sins. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I just want to stop and pray real quick. Lord, thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the fulfilled promise as we see in scripture. I pray that this morning you'd speak through me and you would speak to our hearts and uh, we would hear from you and encounter you through your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. amen, amen. So Isaiah 53, I believe, is one of the most incredible chapters in all of the Bible. You look at the accuracy at which these prophecies were fulfilled and it's mind boggling. It's, it's unbelievable. And I wish I had time to unpack it all, but we're gonna spend our time kind of zeroing in on verse five where it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds or his stripes we are healed. If Jesus never came as an infant, he could never grow up and die. And if Jesus never died and, and rose again, then we would never have the opportunity to have a great exchange. We would never have that opportunity to exchange our hurt for his healing. Praise God that he has come, right? That, that is a good thing. Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not, or don't forget all of his benefits, who forgives all of our sins and heals all your diseases. I believe that God forgives all our sins. How many would agree? And I believe that God heals all of our diseases. But by a show of hands, how many have ever lost a loved one or prayed for someone and healing did not come and they remained sick? They remained with disease that, that just never worked out the way that we were praying and believing. And I think that when we look at a scripture like Psalms 103, or we see it in 1 Peter, or we see it in the Gospels, we see where sickness and uh, iniquity, sickness and sin are often paired together. We see it. We often tend to believe that, yes, God forgives all of our sins, but it's a little bit more difficult, if we're being honest, to believe that God heals all our diseases. How many would maybe agree with that? Maybe you're going through something and you're thinking, man, yeah, that's, that's difficult. Have you ever wondered if God heals all of my sickness and he heals all of my disease, then, then why do I still get sick, right? I've, I've wondered that. I've asked that question. And I think there have been many harmful answers to that question. You know, people say, oh, oh brother Bob, uh, you are still sick because there's unrepented sin in your life, and you've got sin in your life, and that's why you're sick. Or sister, sister Sally, you know, uh, the reason why you aren't healed is because you just didn't have enough faith. You just got to believe. Or heathen Henry, God must have placed this sickness on you for a reason. He just wants you to learn and grow through it. Hear me, 930. Hear me online. God will never place sickness on you as a punishment. He will never punish you by placing sickness on you. And I won't get into it completely, but theologically, he can't. 
He can't. You might learn through your hurt and you might grow through your pain, but God will never punish you by placing sickness on you because he's already placed it on Jesus. He took our pain. He bore our suffering. By his stripes, we are healed. Do you understand that? One of the worst things a person can do is try to explain unexplainable things. Don't, don't go around trying to explain, well, this person was healed because X, Y, Z, and this person wasn't healed because X, Y, and Z. That's harmful and it's hurtful. Some of the most kind-hearted and well-intentioned people have caused some deep, deep hurt and pain to those uh, dealing with the, the topic of healing or, or pregnancy complications. And I hope to address a little bit of that later in my sermon. But I personally have drawn the conclusion and I fully believe that by Jesus' stripes we are healed. I believe that God forgives all of our sins and I 100% believe that he heals all of our diseases and our sickness. And my goal this morning is to try to help you understand how I've come to that conclusion and how I've drawn that. And I'm gonna attempt to do that by answering three questions. You guys ready? Question one, no, nobody's ready. Does, I'm going anyway, does God still heal? Does God still heal? That's the first question. In short, the answer is yes, but we'll get into it. Let's start with the first half of Psalms 103, where it says, uh, it's, it's easier for us to believe the first half, right, of God forgiving all of our iniquities, forgiving all of our sins. It says this, the Lord who forgives all your sins. What does it mean when God forgives all sins? Well, I would believe that that means that he forgives past sins, he forgives present sins, and he's going to forgive future sins. That would be a pretty good definition of all. So, so stick with me for just a little bit. As we look back to the work of the cross of Jesus Christ, we see God's faithfulness in the fact that he forgave us and he saved us from the penalty of our sin from the penalty of our sin. It, it says in the scripture that we just read in, in, in verse four and five of Isaiah 53, that he took on our iniquities, that he bore our sins. God placed that on him. He died for the penalty of our sins. It took place in the past, it happened, it's final, it's over, it's official. And we see that looking back. Then we look in the now, and hopefully we see that God is saving us and forgiving us and, and saving us from the power of our sins. We are becoming overcomers. He, he, is, he is saving us from the power of sin where we are being set free from the sin that so easily entangles us. And so now we look back, we see that God has forgiven us. We see that God is forgiving us. That gives us confidence that we look forward to the future that God will forgive us. And, and not just will forgive us, but he's going to save us from the very presence of sin. So he saves us from the penalty, he saves us from the power, and he saves us eventually someday in the future from the very presence of sin when all things are made new and we join him in heaven. I am so thankful for that. Now, what does the Bible say about Jesus? It says in, in Hebrews 13, 8, it says that Jesus was the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Revelation, it says that he was, he is, and he is to come. He forgave us, he's forgiving us, he will forgive us. That's good news, folks. That is good news, and that is worthy, he is worthy of our praise for that. But does that mean because God will forgive us all our sins that we just keep on sinning and we just sin, sin, sin so that grace may abound? By no means. That's not what that means. But it does put to rest the temptation to try to earn our salvation. It puts to rest the temptation to earn our forgiveness because we see that God is involved in all aspects of salvation. So let me ask you this. If God forgives us of all of our sins, then why do we still sin? If God forgives us of all our iniquities, then why do we still sin? Why do you still sin? I mean, I don't sin, but you guys do. I mean, what? no, I'm just teasing. That's a sin, okay? It's just a joke. Some of you are still waking up. 
Either that or I'm not as funny as I think, which is probably also the truth. If God has saved us from all our sins, then why do we continue to sin? The answer is very simple. We live in a sin-filled, fallen world, right? But rejoice because there is a new world coming. There will be a time where we are saved from the very presence of sin. And I look forward to that day where all things, the old order is gone and God ushers in his kingdom, in the fullness of his kingdom. I look forward to that. The second half of our text in 103.3 says, and heals all our diseases. So I ask you this, what does all diseases mean? Well, I believe that um, God brings healing in our past, has brought healing in our past, He's, he's bringing healing in our present and will in the future. So, so stick with me. I know this is a little bit teachy, but you're going to see here just how closely salvation and healing are married and, and how they work together, okay? So as we look back to the faithfulness of God, where, where Jesus is on the cross, we see that God saved us from the penalty of our sickness. It says in the scripture that we read that he took on our pain and he bore our sufferings for my healing. It's by Jesus' stripes or his wounds that we are healed. That took place. That happened. That's final. That's official, right? That took place. In God's faithfulness, he saved us from the penalty of our sickness. Then hopefully now, as we look to our now, we see that God is saving us from the power of our sickness. What do you mean by that? Well, God has sent his Holy Spirit that gives us strength. God has sent his Holy Spirit that guides us. God has sent his, his Holy Spirit that enables us to endure. And we start to see that God is saving us from the power, the grip of sickness because he is with us. He is Emmanuel. He is with us and he's saving us. So we look back, we see that God has saved us from the penalty. We look now, he's saving us from the power of sickness but that gives us confidence as we look forward to the future that someday he's going to save us from the very presence of our sickness. In Revelation 21.4, it says this, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Oh man, do I long for that day? Anybody? Anybody just say, oh, I just long for that. For the old order of things has passed away. Do you guys see how similar salvation and healing are? How God is saving us from the penalty, the power, and the presence? Do you, do you see that? Even, even in the way that we doubt about these things, it, it, there's similarities. You know, we, we sin. Ah, I just messed up again. I just sinned. Am I even saved? Will, will, will God save me? Can he save me? Or, oh, no, I'm, I'm sick again. Great. More sickness. God, are you with me? God, do you, do you heal me? Are, are, you, are you moving? Here's what happens, and this is a truth that's applicable in multiple facets of life, and I want everybody to hear this. Now always screams louder than the past or your future. Now always screams louder than the past and the future. What do I mean by that? Well, you're in conflict with your spouse and they say something really hurtful. Now screams louder than the past thousand I love you texts that you've received. What do I mean by that? You're living in pain in the now and you're in the middle of suffering. Now screams louder than the future promise of a glorified body where there is no more suffering and sickness and pain. What, what do I mean by that? Oh, I just sinned and, and I'm, 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 I, I, I messed up and, and I've, I've fell short. Now screams louder than yesterday's victory and the hope of victory tomorrow. Do you guys see, see that? And this is what happens. You might be going through the most difficult season of your life and the enemy wants nothing more than for you to sit down in your valley of despair, for you just to sit in your pain and you to focus on your hurt and you just, you focus in on the now. But what God is saying is he's saying, look up my child, look up my son and daughter, look back to the past, 
and see my faithfulness, how I have saved you, and look forward to the, my great promises and how I'm going to save you. I am with you. God still heals. You better believe it this morning. But does God exist inside or outside of time? Outside, right? He exists outside of time. See, one of our problems is that our view of a promise or a declarative statement, such as the one that we're looking at today, is that we impose the restriction of time to a promise. We view physical death as the end of the opportunity of God to fulfill his promise. God still heals. He did yesterday, he does today, and he will tomorrow. At the end of today's service, I'm going to call people that have a need in your life. We're going to believe for healing. We're going to pray for healing. That's what we're instructed to do, right? And so if you've got a need, I want you to come. If you're watching online, comment. Just say, I need prayer. We'll be praying for you this week as we go through the comments. But I'm going to invite you to come down into this altar area, and we're going to pray for anyone who needs prayer, or maybe you have someone in your family or a friend that you want to stand in and represent. We're going to pray and believe that. So I want you to be ready. So the second question is, how do I receive healing? If God still heals, how do I receive healing? Well, I'll ask you this. How are you saved? How, how are your iniquities you know, made clean? How, how, did, how, how are you forgiven? How are you saved? Is it that you go say 50 Hail Marys and you go to confession and then you give a bunch of money and you live a good life and you deprive yourself of all pleasures, you know, and that's how, how we're saved? No, no. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for it is by grace through faith you have been saved. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the what of God? The gift of God, not by works so that no man may boast. We are forgiven purely by grace through faith that works. Or maybe you're a King James, through faith, or by grace through faith unto works. See, James in his book says that faith without works are dead. It's not real faith. So it's not that works um, you know, saves us, but works is just the evidence of our faith. And, and, and so the Greek, the word faith, literally is pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, -I -I right? Pistis. I've, I've taught this before. It literally translated means trusting obedience. So when you have faith in Jesus, it means I have a trusting relationship with God that leads me to obedience. That is what faith means. But hopefully we all agree that we are forgiven based upon what Jesus did. It's a gracious act on his behalf by grace through faith that works. That's how we're saved. So I ask you this, how are we healed? It's by grace through faith that works. I want everybody to pay attention to me right now and I want you to hear this. If anyone has ever told you the reason why that you weren't healed or you're still sick is because you don't have enough faith or the reason why your child didn't receive healing, your son, your daughter, your mom, your parent, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your relative, your neighbor, your coworker, it's because you didn't have enough faith. I want you to remember this Greek word, belagna. That, that's a bunch of baloney. That's a bunch of baloney and here's why. And listen to me. As soon as we attach our healing to the amount of faith we have, we have attached our healing to works and not to the grace that is extended to us from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Our healing isn't attached to works. It's attached to Christ and his word. And if that healing takes place here on earth or tomorrow in heaven, it's a grace that's extended from God. Hear me, church. It is God's grace that extends healing to us. And it's God's grace that enables us to endure until we receive that healing. You understand? 
think about it in salvation. It's God's grace that saves you, and it's God's grace that keeps you until salvation is made complete and we're glorified in heaven from the very presence of sin. It's God's grace that brings healing, and it's God's grace that enables you to endure until you receive it. You understand? I'll get to my third question in a little bit, but right now I want you to stand. If you're able. In just a moment, we're gonna open up the altar area. We're gonna pray. We're gonna believe. If you need prayer for anything, I I just encourage you, just come forward. I want to share with you this morning, we've got a lot of needs in our family. Pastor Jeff, you know, mentioned we've had 11 people in our church that have had a relative, a sibling, a parent, a grandparent, uh, people from our church. We've had 11 deaths this week. We had 10 of them happen by 1045 a.m. on Wednesday. We've had people transfer to Iowa City, and I'll get to that in just a minute. And I'm, this whole time I'm preparing this sermon, hurt for healing, death, 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 death. I've never seen our pastoral text message thread blow up with so much sickness and so much death in one week. Wednesday morning, I wake up and I've got a sty in my eye. Like, really, Lord? (laughs) Get the hot rag and you're just like, you know, God heals, and we're going to believe for that. So I want you to be thinking, what need is represented in your life? Maybe it's really painfully obvious, and you just know the healing that you need to seek God and ask him to come in. But if you don't, there's two needs that I want to bring to attention that happened just this week. The first picture up here is of Matt and Amanda and Noah House. Many of you know Matt and Amanda. They go to the 11 o'clock. They're in Sunday school. And their son, Noah, who's in eighth grade. Noah was born with um, a, uh, a, a condition, a bone density issue, where his bones don't produce healthy enough collagen. Now, collagen is what makes your bones strong. And so he's very susceptible to breaks. And he's had this his entire life. And Monday at school, he was at school and he... He had just gotten off some crutches from a previous break and he slipped on some, uh, something in the lunchroom and he broke his, uh, his femur and he broke his hip area. He tore his thigh muscle and several tendons. And I know that you guys are watching right now online, Matt and Amanda, we're about ready to pray for Noah. Noah, God sees you and he loves you. So he slips, he calls, and I'm talking to Matt on the phone this week and he he said, Dad, you got to get down to the school right now. This is, this is not good. This is not good. I need you here. And then Matt told me that right there on the phone, he heard his son, his eighth grader, just begin to cry out to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I need you in this moment. God, help me. Help me, God. And he just began to cry out to Jesus in that moment, right there in that school lunch with kids around and just the whole commotion. I'm believing Noah, that God is going to give you a testimony. I don't know what it's going to look like, but you've got a lot of years ahead of you. And I'm believing that your platform is huge. It's wide and it all brings glory. And so we're going to pray for believing or pray for healing. We're going to believe that God's going to heal him of this collagen, this bone density issue. We pray for his mom and dad. He was taken to the ambulance uh, by, by ambulance to uh, Des Moines Hospital. They got there and said, it's too extensive of a surgery. We can't do it. So they took him to Iowa City and then Tuesday morning he had surgery. He's back home watching now. So would you pray for Noah this morning if you don't have something? And this next picture, go ahead and put up the picture of Noah so you can see it. That other one was really small. There's Noah. It's this, Noah, you are like my hero, dude. You are just, I wish all kids could be like you. He's just the sweetest young man. This next picture is of James and Abby Ann, their daughter Penelope, 
their next son, James Dean, and then baby Samuel. Now Samuel, baby Samuel, he's three months old. He's a miracle baby. In utero, there was fluid on his brain that was beginning to build up and it was causing some issues. And, and they were talking about having to induce her and pull her out or pull him out um, soon, but God slowed that. But as soon as he came out, they had to have surgery. They put a shunt in, drained the fluid, but he's dealt with seizures since day one of his life. And this Tuesday, uh, Abby Ann took him in to uh, the clinic, was getting some things. They noticed his oxygen was super low, so they take him to the ER and uh, he's got an infection. He's got a lot of things going on. He coded on, on, I believe it was Tuesday, and they performed CPR on this three, this three month old baby boy. And they brought him back to life. They're doing everything that they could here at Des Moines, and I'm so thankful for Mercy and their staff. But they said, we can't do anything else. We've, we've got to get him to Iowa City. So Noah goes to Iowa City via ambulance. Samuel gets life flighted from a helicopter to Iowa City. And that's where they're at. And I believe you're watching online right now. And James, Abby Ann, I pray that you would just sense God's presence in your room. Likely, Samuel is going to have to have brain surgery here shortly. He's still got infection in his body. His oxygen hasn't returned to normal. Um, his blood pressure is up. Would you join me in prayer for this sweet baby boy? That there would be a testimony of healing. I know that there are many others here today that need a touch. There's a, a girl in our youth group. I, I can't tell everybody's story, you know, so please don't be offended if I don't tell yours. But there's a girl in our youth group, Laura, and she's dealt with, with migraines for years, and she's recently had an MRI, and they, doctors can't figure out what it is, but it's debilitating to her. And so we're believing. We've got so many needs, so much sickness, but we know the God who can do something about it. So I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to invite people to come forward and we're going to believe that God is going to do the impossible this morning. Jesus, I pray right now, God, just for every hurting heart. I first, God, want to acknowledge the person in the room that their heart is struggling with understanding why things turned out the way it did. And I pray, God, that in their grief and in their sorrow right now that they would be overwhelmed with a peace and a comfort and just wrap your loving arms around that individual that's just struggling in this moment here in this room, God. Would you allow them to know that you're with them? So God, we just ask that you would turn all grief into glory, that you would bring purpose to our pain, transformation to our torment, God, a testimony to our trial, God, a song in our suffering, Jesus. I pray, God, for healing of all sickness and all disease. I pray against depression and anxiety. I pray, God, that you would heal us. For those who have cancer, Lord, I just pray right now that those uh, would just feel like an electricity current come through their bodies and it would just begin to evaporate all forms and traces of cancer, God. We believe that by your stripes we are healed. We ask it in Jesus' name. I pray for against headaches and migraines, God, for spine issues, alignment issues, back issues, if legs need to grow and even out so people can walk in a normal way, God. I pray that you would just begin to do that. I pray for deep hurts emotionally, God, for childhood trauma, divorce, the feeling of betray, uh, being betrayed or abandonment, God. I pray that you'd bring healing mentally, God. I pray that you'd unclog and declutter thoughts and give the full reigns of our thought life to you and that you would keep us on a path, God. I pray, God, for relational needs, Jesus, and hurts. I pray for marriages and friendships, parents to children, children to, to parents, siblings, aunts, relatives, neighbors, co-workers, God, spiritually for the first time, if there's people here that are realizing that they are away from you, God, that you would bring a healing, that you would forgive sins for strongholds. I believe that there's some people who felt like, like, they may be missed coming forward and being set free a few weeks ago, God, but you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and your mercies and your grace are new every morning. So God, I pray healing, and we believe that there is nothing that you can't do. 
We, we have seen too much to believe that there is nothing that you can't do, Lord. And so I just pray that you begin to do the supernatural in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. So as you come forward right now, we're going to sing this song. We're going to believe there will be people to pray with you. I'm going to start over in this corner. I'm going to work here. We'll have pastors on that corner. And we're going to do our best to get to everyone. But would you step forward right now if you've got a need and you want to pray as we sing this. I told you that I was going to answer three questions. Now, if you're any good at math at all, you realize that I've only answered two questions this morning. So the third question is what happens if I'm not healed? It's a good question. It's a fair question. Like, I believe that God can heal me. I'm putting my faith and my trust in God's timing. I'm trying to be okay with things. But what happens if I'm not healed? And I think that the Apostle Paul has the appropriate response in his letter to the Philippians. Now, in Philippians, he's in chains. He's in jail. He's in prison, and he's writing this. And one of the most famous verses of all Philippians is Philippians 1.21. People love it. It says, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain, right? And that's a beautiful anthem, and it takes a little bit for someone to hear that the first time and really understand what he's saying. But I think that verse 20 is actually more powerful in, in some ways. Remember that he's chained up right now. He is physically and emotionally spent as he writes this in verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. So that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Did you know that God can receive just as much glory in your pain as he can through your healing? Think, think about that for just a moment. In the midst of your hurt, in the midst of your pain and your suffering, in your now, Christ can be exalted through it all. So I ask you this, when will you allow God to turn your mourning into dancing? The great author C.S. Lewis says, that God speaks to you in your pleasures, but he shouts to you in your pain. I think that for some of you this morning, if your ears are open, your heart is open, you would hear your loving father from heaven shouting, saying, I am with you. Take my hand, I am with you. I am your healer. I'm your provider. I am with you. I see you in your pain. I see you in your hurt. I see you in your struggling. I, the Lord your God, am with you. And he's shouting that to you this morning. God, this morning, I pray that our hearts would receive the truth of your word, that we would believe wholeheartedly that you forgive all our iniquities and heal all our disease. And so we thank you for your faithfulness to us in the past. We thank you for your faithful to, faithfulness to us in the now, God. And we look forward to the faithfulness in the future, Jesus. So I pray, God, whatever situation is represented here, is watching online, where, whoever's ears this falls on, I pray, God, that you would be glorified through the involvement of you in our lives giving us the ability to endure until we receive the healing that you've promised us. With every eye closed and head bowed, I, I feel led. If there's anyone in the room that say, I have never experienced salvation. I've never asked God to come into my heart to, to repent of my sins, ask him to, to make me new. If that's you, just with every eye closed out of respect for your neighbor, would you just raise your hand and look at me and say, I'm asking Jesus into my heart for the first time today. Is there anyone here today? anyone here if you're watching online I want you to know that God sees you he loves you he's with you he will forgive you you haven't done too much for him to save you for his grace and his mercy is new every morning God bless you all as we we leave
this morning. I pray that his face would shine upon you, that you would walk in his very presence and, and acknowledge that he is with you, he is in you, and he goes before you. And so come back tonight at six. You won't regret it. Next Sunday night, empty chair service. You won't regret it. We got good stuff going on. Hug a neck, shake a hand, be friendly as you leave. Find a Sunday school class, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining